Five. I don't ever do that. I'm just hamming it up. <coughs> Won't you listen to reason? Well, you open your eyes. It's a wonder what you'll find with an open mind. Hey everybody, welcome to the Atheist Experience. We are live. Today is December 19th, 2010. And if you saw bits of last show, uh, you know that the phone situation here in our public access TV studio is that their phones didn't work last week. We have great news. The phones still don't work this week. Um, I'm Matt Dillahoney. Joining me this week, Tracy Harris. And we found out about it with enough lead time. And of course, we saw the mistakes from last week that uh, we actually bothered to do a little bit of homework. So Tracy's brought something cool to talk about. I flagged a bunch of emails and, and discussion points uh, as well. But let me get the, the regular announcements out of the way. Uh, this program is live on public access television. It's sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin, a nonprofit educational organization promoting positive atheism and the separation of church and state. The ACA has weekly meetings every, at sun, every Sunday at Romeo's on Barton Springs Road beginning around 1130, except for the first Sunday of the month when we host our lecture series at the Austin History Center. Uh, the next lecture will be January 2nd. Hopefully everybody will be done partying in time to get to the History Center by 1215 uh, because Don Baker is going to be talking about the mechanisms of religious evil uh, at that particular lecture, and we're looking forward to that. In addition to uh, this program, the ACA also sponsors a bi-weekly internet audio podcast, which I need to change that from bi-weekly to kind of weekly, because the nonprofits, which you can find out more about by going to nonprofitsradio.com, that's P-R-O-P-H-E-T-S, uh, we had our last episode of the year uh, a week ago Saturday, now see, you're confusing me. Um, and when we come back, we're going to switch to a weekly format. Keep it roughly the same link, but if we go a little shorter, it's not going to be a big deal. Um, and we're going to try to do it weekly that way. If we have to skip a week, we end up just skipping a week and not three weeks, which is what happens when we, when we missed weeks or six months, as was the case last year, where we just weren't having shows. Uh, in addition to the various media outreach efforts, the ACA also sponsors a number of other activities, including happy hour every Thursday at the Dog and Duck Pub uh, at 17th and Guadalupe. And beginning Monday, January 10th, if you're in the Austin area and you're a member or a friend of a member of the ACA, uh, we're going to start ha hosting Godless Gamers at my place. It's a board game, card game, party game group. Uh, just some fun things to do on Monday nights. And for more information you can on any of that or to find out more about the ACA, you can email tv at atheist-community.org. That goes to myself, uh, the co-host, the a lot of people behind the scenes, and if you're if you're looking for information about the board game group, you can go just email president at atheist-community.org. That goes to me, and I can get you information on how to get to where we're playing the games and how much room we have and what games we may be playing. So, um, since there are no phones today, obviously I can't be mean and hang up on people, um, which seems to be one of the the things people find more interesting than, than other shows. Uh, this is the last show of the year when we come back after the, show, after the new year. Um, we'll still be in the studio. Hopefully we'll have the phones working. If we don't, the plan is to go ahead and get something like uh, Skype or some other uh, voice over IP set up and we'll get that information out and put up on the website. You can find out more about the ACA by going to the ACA's website, www.atheist-community.org, and there's a calendar of events, a frequently asked questions page, a um, bunch of news items and other things. And after this show's over, we get together for dinner, and we're still going to Thread Gills this evening. It's 301 West Riverside Drive. Any atheist or atheist-friendly person is welcome to come to any of our events, except possibly for Godless Gamers, where I'd kind of like to have people I know come into my house. But um, after the first of the year, though, we will be changing where we're having dinner, so stay tuned for that. We'll make an announcement. It'll be up on the website as well as, as on the show. Um, and with that, the next 45 minutes are yours. You gotta do bars. I know. Oh, I gotta do pause bars. bars. <laughs> okay. They'll figure it out. Okay. Um, 
yeah, what I, the, the thing I wanted to talk about, it's funny because I had reams and reams of notes that I didn't bring all the notes, but I do know what I want to talk about, so mm -hmm. that should be okay. I had an exchange with um, a theist who identif identified as, a, as an agnostic predominantly, which was interesting, but they were a theist. They, they acknowledged they were not an atheist, so they were a theist agnostic. And um, during the exchange, I got a, a miracle story, which you know we're familiar with. You get these miracle stories like that people call in and they say, "Well, I had this thing happen to me, and I couldn't sure. explain it." And then they start to talk about it. And what's and always then they explain it? Yeah. And what's always interesting to me is there's like this initial description of it, and then when you start to ask questions about it, it starts to unravel a bit, and you always start getting deeper and deeper into it, and then the person begins to sort of try to explain more and more what's going on and sometimes sometimes the story will change up to where it conflicts with what was said originally right. and sometimes what was said originally makes more of something that when you start asking well how do you know this yeah. fact that you're putting forward and they'll start to explain how they know it and you're like okay well that's not really confirming that that's what occurred your story doesn't have anything to do with like waking up in the middle of the night does it um Actually, it doesn't. I will okay. say that that's one of my first things. That's Whenever, my favorite. Yeah, the, the first thing I always want to know when someone tells a story about a personal experience where it's like a unique thing to them, right. where they say, this happened to me and I was on my own, my first thought is always, were you napping? Were you, had you gone to bed? Were you going to bed I've had people, soon? <laughs> I've had people start up? the stories and say, I was, I was awakened in the middle of the night and there's a figure standing there yes. and I'm going... We already know <laughs> enough about how the brain works right. that you have no basis f right. f for claiming that you actually saw anything right. other than you know, the, the, the waking dream state yeah. and all these other things right after you wake up. Um, or I got this premonition in my sleep and I woke up and three minutes later it happened. Yeah, there's all kinds of things like yeah. that. You, you uh, cannot trust what's going on in your brain <coughs> as you're going to sleep, as you're getting tired. When you wake up, when you haven't been awake for very long, I mean, you, you just you, you can be wide awake really in the middle of the day, it. and still there are situations yeah. where you can't trust what you're exactly. You know, yeah, initial but, but at of times when when there's like you know odd chemicals pumping and coursing through your brain that don't normally course through your brain in waking hours, you should not trust what you encounter um, during sleep hours or near sleep hours. But in this um, particular one. There actually, this actually was a story that in, involved a lot of people, like a number of people, and it was interesting to me because at the end of the story, I guess my question was sort of like, what was the miracle? So I was sort of stunned about why this would be a miraculously impressive story. And just, I'm just going to read the exact first account of what I was provided, and it says, um, out of curiosity, I ask how you can scientifically typically prove how this happened. And I think what they really meant by that was what I'm about to tell you, how would you give it like an explanation, a natural explanation? And the story says, a young girl between the ages of three and four drowns and dies. A man who has failed every CPR test in his life brings her back to life. Later on, she tells her mother that she has a little sister named Emily. Emily does not exist. The little girl says she does. When asked who told her this, she said a lady in white did in a white room. Keep in mind, the hospital had no white rooms where she was at, and the nurses were not wearing white. Later on, the mother is pregnant. The little girl says, this is not Emily. It is not. It is a boy. Later on, the mother is pregnant again. Same thing happens. Another boy. The family decides they are not going to have any more children, but then the mother gets pregnant one more time. The little girl says, this is Emily, and a girl is born. For the record, this is a true story with many witnesses. How is it that this little girl saw this lady in white in a white room while she was dead and then predicted the birth of her sister? This is why I am not atheist, because I believe something or someone does exist, and there is some kind of place after death besides six feet under or ashes. Can you spot the miracle? I, I don't see a miracle. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I, I have nothing but, but questions and things to point out where there's just glaringly obvious mistakes and holes. Okay, thank but you. you get to do it. <laughs> 
Yeah, I'll start, and if you want, to, I mean, sometimes when you when you do, you take them things, pretty much I'll, in order. Okay, because if I, you I miss try. the first one, I'm yeah, going to jump I'm gonna all try. over. Yeah, I'm going to try. But um, there's there were a, there's a lot of other dialogue that occurs after this. But it, um, first, let me just say that you know my first line of response to anything like this is that you telling me a story is not confirmation that what you just told me even occurred. Right. Anyone can go on the internet and make up a story. So. First off, I don't take any stories like this at face value. But what I do like to do when someone's handing me a story like this sometimes is to say to myself, what if this is, what if what the person is telling me is completely accurate? What then would I make of this? Like what if I, for example, experienced this firsthand and this happened where I was? And the, what would I make of it? The, the, the first one, the first thing I spotted, and I, I don't know if you actually hit on this or not uh, in the commentary, was right off the bat, uh, this girl drowns and dies. Um, a man who's failed every CPR test in his life brings her back to life. Mm -hmm. Do you rip that to shreds? Because Well, the first question I have about it is, I'm going to say, to me, if we're going to call a miracle something that is like stretches the bounds of reality, I've honestly got to say that the only miracle I see in the story is that an adult repeatedly failed a CPR test. Yeah. Because, I'm just going to say, when I lived in Florida, I grew up in Florida, lots of water around Florida for people who don't know, tons of lakes, it's a peninsula surrounded on uh, all sides almost except for you know, the top by ocean. And if there's one thing they teach you in Florida and one thing they are hyper aware of and conscious about, it's water safety. Mm -hmm. Children in Florida, when I was a child, I don't, I don't know what they're doing now, but in middle school, they started teaching you about the age of 12 CPR and got all the children certified. So you went into your phys physical education class at school, they would do a one hour CPR training course, the children would go up, repeat the instruction, get their certification card. The next day or the next, you know, depending on how often you had phys ed, the next hour that you took for physical education, the rest of the class went up, did theirs, got their certification card. Mm -hmm. When you go to the certification websites, for example, the American Heart Association offers CPR certification here in Austin. If you go to the American Heart Association website to see how you get your certification, it says you go in for the class and, when, and, and on the fact page it says, when do I get my certification card? And it says everyone gets their card at the end of the class. There is nothing on the fact page to answer the question, if I fail, how soon can I take the test again? And that is because no one fails this test. I'm not going to say that I know for a fact that no one has ever failed a CPR class, but you either have to be the worst test taker ever, or you have to have horrendous stage fright because you do have to do it in front of a group of people, or you have to be less cognitively capable than a 12 year old well my thing is that this is like the second line in the story okay uh, a young girl drowns and and it says a man who has failed every CPR test in his life brings her back to life okay first of all it's got all the telltale signs of exaggeration and glurge and right. and and I don't find much of anything that comes after this believable so I'm already objecting here for the same reason that you do that I, I think it's kind of silly to say that somebody but failed the CPR test but if you think about it think about it, let's assume that it actually happened that oh, there yeah. is a guy who who failed multiple CPR tests I did I assumed it <laughs> I have taken one of those CPR certifications 30 some odd years ago or whatever and probably did another one in the Navy. Um, I don't remotely think that I'm qualified to perform CPR on anybody because I haven't had any current modern training, don't barely remember you know, what I took. It's, right. it's the just certification kind of there. is good for about two to three years. A person who has r repeatedly failed the test is yeah. somebody who has repeatedly taken the course and therefore may have a decent understanding, but n it's not surprising that somebody could perform something akin to some CPR that they heard about and revive somebody who drowned. Right. It's, not so, it's certainly not surprising if they've had training right. in, in resuscitation. Like it's better than nothing is and what you're saying. And if, it's if you even get really close. I mean, yeah. it would be more miraculous for me to do it, having forgotten all this, than somebody who repeatedly takes right. the classes and fails because right. they're getting a constant you pick refresher. Up, you think, you'd not. think they have to pick up something. It, it's, pa it's absurd, yeah. but... Even even if 